From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandot, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Odawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations present and past who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties in our efforts towards decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Elizabeth Brownlow. Elizabeth graduated from BGSU with a doctorate in American Culture Studies. During her time here, she was also a graduate assistant at ICS. She recently was selected for the prestigious 2022 Leading Edge Fellowship from the American Council of Learned Societies. The Leading Edge Fellowships support recent PhDs in the humanities and interpretive social sciences as they work with social justice organizations in communities across the U.S. to solve problems and build organizational capacity. Thanks for joining me today, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Elizabeth, you've had a very interesting and multidisciplinary academic background. Could you start by telling us about what that journey was and kind of some of the things that inspired those academic choices? Yeah. I mean, I guess it all, for a lot of us, it starts with college, right? It starts with undergrad, trying to figure out what we want to do and where we want to go. I was an English major, and I wasn't super sure what I wanted to do with that, but I had faculty that told me try grad school. I think you'd like it. And I had friends going. And so it was actually in grad school that I started really opening up to the world around me and really understanding a lot of things I didn't know. You know, growing up in a really rural area, we kind of had this put your head down, get your work done. The world is what it is kind of a mentality. What can you really do about it? And it was during my time at Texas Women's University in grad school that I attended like my first protest and started reading like you know, narratives from, you know, the Harlem Renaissance and from, you know, from slave narratives. And I started reading about women's studies. And I just started thinking these are things that I want to know more about and I care about, you know, disability studies, things. I just started really getting interested in all of this. And I, I knew I wanted to learn more. So I applied to BGSU mainly because, you know, the American Culture Studies program was so interdisciplinary. And I had been in English up till this point and I really wanted I wanted more. I was like, I want more than just what I'm getting from the English department. I want to be able to study different kinds of things or, you know, have different methods and different topics of study. And I think this is going to give me that, especially because of how closely the ACS department was aligned with the popular culture studies department. And I was like, so, you know, popular culture is for me where a lot of our national narratives are located and where we can kind of see them in practice. And so I started at BGSU and still did not know exactly what I, to do, what I wanted to do when I grew up. I knew that I loved teaching and I got a lot of great experience teaching ethnic studies and teaching women's gender sexuality studies. I got to teach a course on gender, race, and class and romantic comedies, which was so fun. But I felt like I knew who I was as an instructor. And I thought, I, I still feel like like I want more skills, I want more knowledge. And when I found out that there was an opening at the Institute for Study of Culture and Society, and after speaking with you, Dr. Sheffer, I knew this was going to give me a lot more of the like hard skills that I needed. <laughs> you know, I developed all these soft skills of like communication and research, and I just really wanted to learn how to do things like manage social media and event plan and write press releases and ICS gave me that. So I, you know, I came out of my graduate program with all of these very different skill sets and knowledge bases and, you know, also graduated into a pandemic and was trying to figure out what am I going to do? You know, where can I even get hired right now? And I spent a couple of years doing kind of a lot of different things. I did some adjunct teaching as an English instructor at actually my alma mater where I got my bachelor's degree. And I 
did some writing, some freelance writing for an academic online management system. I also did some research and writing for various other companies. And I worked for a company like designing curriculum and that they basically used to teach corporations to kind of improve corporate culture. And so I kind of did some research and writing for them to develop that curriculum and figure out what it meant to improve corporate culture and how to use like personal experience to do that. And I, the whole time was looking for more permanent positions and the ACLS, they, they used to have a public fellowship that really intrigued me trying to place humanities PhDs in public service positions, whether it was nonprofit or government. And I really was interested in what it was doing, but during the pandemic, they kind of took a step back and said, we're reviewing this program right now we're putting it on hold and so I I kind of waited and watched to see what they were doing with it while I was doing all these other things and they started a leading edge fellowship which was sort of similar but initially was focused on a very specific subsect of like religious studies and you know the leading edge fellowship was really meant to be something that kind of met this current moment and so when they opened it up to all humanities PhDs and actually brought in the scope to, you know, kind of changed it from the public fellowship of, okay, so we're working in public service. Now it's, okay, we want them working in any organization that deals with social change and is trying to fight for social justice. And so the belief behind that is that humanities PhDs have a specific certain set of skills and knowledge that would be valuable in working towards social justice, but that we don't often know how to get into those. And so we often don't find our way into these spaces. And so it, the goal is to kind of give us that development and that chance, as well as harness what we developed in our humanities PhD programs that make that would actually add value to these fights and these programs. And when I was looking at the list of the different organizations that were on board with this and wanted a fellow. I was so excited, but more than anything, I just, I honed in really strongly on Power Switch Action, on their mission, on their vision, on the position itself, and how it really was this perfect intersection of the kinds of things I want to do, I want to learn more about, and that I have experience in. And I jumped at the chance to work with them. So tell us more about Power Switch Action. What is their goal? You know, where are they located? How are they working? And then what are some of the things you're doing with them in your role in this Leading Edge Fellowship? So Power Switch Action is actually a national network of local affiliate organizations. We have right now 21 grassroots nonprofit organizations. And basically, we kind of align our strategies. And Power Switch Action as a national team is technically based in the East Bay area in California. And the rest of us are kind of spread, the team is. That actually is something that is kind of new because of the pandemic, they shifted a lot of the work online and they've just never really gone back. We, a lot of us just really still work from different places. A lot of us do work in locations where they have affiliates, but you know, we started in California that's our home base. And that's where originally the idea was that different kinds of unions would come together to work in their workers' interests. And they found they could work stronger together if they could bargain together. So for instance, if a developer comes to town and wants to build this big like arena with housing and businesses and like, we're going to bring jobs. Well, you know, you have a contractor's union that is like, okay, so we want to know that you're actually going to hire us for decent pay as we build this, right? But then you also have a union of people who are concerned with housing and with you know minimum wage jobs and are like okay so you say you're going to bring jobs but are these going to be decent jobs and then you know you also have community members that are worried about where am i going to live what am i going to do and so the idea was that if the different organizations dedicated to these different groups interests worked together to help each other and make sure that agreements with this developer for instance would meet all of these needs then they're stronger, right? First off, they have more voices. They have more power when they work together, but also it ensures that nobody gets left out of that conversation. And this has kind of grown over time. 
we now have organizations, we have faith-based organizations, we have organizations that deal mostly with elections and getting the vote and making sure that people who have been excluded from voting for different reasons are not excluded, mobilizing marginalized communities. We work on leadership development. That's kind of a huge aspect of our work is developing a base of particularly women and people of color and low-income leaders that, I mean, they're the people who actually know what's needed because they're the ones most impacted. And so it's really important that they be at the center of these fights. And so, yeah, our, our ultimate goal, right, it's kind of a lofty one, but our ultimate goal in working together as a network is to achieve a multiracial feminist democracy. And that's kind of our shared vision. And that means, you know, building authentic democracy, meaning that everybody gets a say in their governance, right? Especially those that are affected the most by the changes that are made. It's, it means shaping a people's economy, making sure that we actually have a say in our budgets, where our tax dollars go. It means reigning in corporate power, making sure that they're not exploiting us in every facet of our lives, right? We take a whole worker approach, the idea that a worker is not just a person who works, but a person who lives, has to have a house, has to have access to utilities, has to have a decent wage, a fair schedule. And so one of the things we're really working toward is reigning in corporate power, bringing them to heel when they're exploiting and also growing these civic organizations. We believe that change happens from the ground up, right? That it's this local organizing, these communities that when they start to fight for changes in their smaller neighborhoods and in their towns and in their regions, that just grows because A, you see examples of it happening. It inspires, it brings hope, it shows this is possible, but also, and it also gives strategies, right? This is how they did it. How can we do it here? And it has a ripple effect. And our belief is that national and state level change will only happen through local organizing. And so what are some of the things you're working on with Power Switch Action? So I am working with Power Switch Action as a communications and research strategist, and I'm supposed to act as a bridge between their communications team and between research needs. So we have kind of a host of different research needs for our different campaigns and program areas. And my job is to kind of be able to suss out what research is needed and help facilitate that, as well as to figure out how we can communicate that to really broaden our impact. And so, you know, for instance, I might do messaging research, narrative research to see how have we fought something similar before, right? And then come to the table and say, okay, so here's how we should be developing our messaging guidance for affiliates, right? Because that's the thing they're crying for right now. Or this is the kind of things we might look at and need to get funding for so we can actually look into it. But Another role that I kind of have informally is the fact that I'm a humanities PhD means that I'm bringing in humanistic research methods, which is something that is kind of new, at least to this space. And, you know, Francis, right now I'm conducting a little bit of historical research and analysis, you know, and it's not just for a report. It's literally to guide our messaging. Right now I'm taking like deep oral history training. And we're going to be using that to inform some stuff. And so it's, these are the kinds of things that we may be, you know, textual analysis, oral history. These are the kinds of things we normally wouldn't turn to for research, right? But kind of part of my role is helping us imagine how we can use qualitative data to kind of capture the more difficult to capture, like more, maybe more abstract ideas, right? You know, for instance, like, what is leadership development? What is cultural organizing? what kind of narratives have been used in the past to win a fight that we can harness and adapt for today. Those kinds of big questions that are a little, they're not numerical. They can't really be quantified. You know, when you talk about a lot of these grassroots organizations and, you know, I'm imagining from many of the organizations you're working with at the local level, these are volunteers. These are folks who are working, cobbling things together. Like this is a you know, this is an unpaid sort of part-time gig that they're passionate about, but isn't necessarily paying the bills. How is Power Switch actually operating to kind of help them build their capacity, given that they, these tend not to be like large organizations you're working with? So base building is one of our key areas. 
We have some affiliates with really interesting membership structures that we're trying to help others think through. So, you know, for instance, you know, we might have an affiliate with membership structure to where they have members that also kind of lead and are trained as leaders. So they're not just like, they don't just show up to things. They are, because they are members of this organization, they are trained to organize, they are trained to lead. And so literally just showing up to this place means you're going to be trained. And what's interesting is a lot of people come into this work as volunteers. Maybe they show up, you know, and we have different levels. And this is, you know, one of the things that we do is, you know, we work with our affiliates as well to figure out, okay, so we have these different levels of engagement from our base, right? You might have some people that literally just, you know, you ask them to show up to the city council meeting, they showed up to the city council meeting. And that's great. But we also have some people that they want to get involved more. They want to organize people to get them to that city council meeting. And we try to feature their stories as much as possible because those are the people who really know what's going on and have the best stories. They usually come to these spaces because of their experiences with, you know, corporate exploitation in one form or another. And they have really powerful stories to tell of how it mobilized them and got them helping out others. We offer grants as well for specific, if it's a campaign that we're working on nationally, we might give grants to specific organizations that are have their own campaigns in that area and would like to develop it in some way. So whether they need to hire staff for that or outsource research for that or outsource communications for that, whatever it is that they need, you know, they propose it to us. And then if we feel it definitely is doable and is something that, you know, we want to get on board with as a network, then we help them out with that financially. And we also, we have these deep leadership training institutes to help them develop not just the hard skills around organizing and base building, but the soft skills, right? And I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't think about when it comes to leadership development is there are soft skills needed, including self-care. That's one of the soft skills, right? How do you take care of yourself so you can actually do this work? How can you prepare yourself to do this kind of work? It's not easy work. And especially in these grassroots organizations, right? They're on the front lines of this. They're the ones who are every day waking up to a new problem in their community that they have to, you know, get people together and mobilize them to fight against or to, you know, work toward. And so we kind of offer support in a variety of different ways, you know, whether it's financially through the grants, whether it's through just having people, you know, a director in charge of that area, working with affiliates on developing their campaigns, whether it's directing them toward funding, whether it's, you know, training them in, you know, equitable practices for managing things, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that we really want. And we also, a lot of it is we offer capacity. Right. By having a national team that connects these different affiliates, we add capacity. We have a full communications team at this point on the national team. And that is, I mean, it's our first time having a full communications team and we're really excited about it. But it means that, you know, not only do we have, you know, capacity to amplify their work, but it also means that we now have a communications cohort, right? We have communications leads from every affiliate now getting together and thinking through what their strategies are and developing together. And so kind of, you know, we offer in different ways. And one of our goals constantly is kind of stepping back and thinking, what is our role in this as a national team? What is our role in this fight? What is our role in these specific campaigns? What's needed? And how can we make sure that everyone has the resources and the research that they need to make, to actually go through with these campaigns? We're going to take a quick break. Thanks for listening to the Big Ideas Podcast. If you are passionate about big ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Elizabeth Brownlow, a PhD graduate of American Culture Studies at BGSU and a recently appointed Leading Edge Fellow with the American Council of Learned Societies. Elizabeth, when you began the PhD program, you talked about not being exactly sure kind of where you would go with that, but you also did have these different experiences, as you mentioned, as a TA in different units, as a GA with ICS. Were there key experiences during your time at BGSU 
that sort of helped prepare you for some of the things you're doing with Power Switch Action and for this kind of policy directed work? The dissertation writing process is an experience that kind of really shaped me in many ways in my approach to, you know, not just research, but in communicating that research. You know, first off, just the process of writing a dissertation means that you're constantly like back and forth receiving feedback. That's something that you don't get tons of in the rest of your school experience. Usually if you get feedback from like an instructor, it's a one and done, right? They give their feedback, you either fix it or you don't, depending on the requirements of the course. A dissertation has so much more back and forth that you kind of get a lot more accustomed to that, like I'm writing and then somebody's looking at it and they're changing it. And it's a little more collaborative in that way. And so I got a lot more accustomed to the idea of somebody just like always having opinions on my work, which is something that, you know, in this space is actually really important. I have to be very comfortable. We change each other's stuff all the time. We just want to make sure that multiple eyes get on the work and that this is actually the best that it can be and that it reaches the audiences it needs to reach. And so I don't think anyone on the comms team ever puts anything out that doesn't get changed in some way. Part of that is the hard skill of like, okay, so making sure that you know how to get it and adapt and change, but also it's the soft skill of, okay, so being able to take that feedback and harness it and use it in productive ways so that you're still working together as a team and it's all good and nobody's taking anything personally. But also I would say that I remember in ICS, we had the faculty fellowship and it was geared toward getting, you know, humanities research that was community engaged, that was publicly engaged, that really had an impact on the public good somehow. And really just having those conversations with faculty and trying to help them think through, like rethink their approach to that research and to disseminating it, right? Like, what is it that you want this research to do? What does it have potential to do? Really shaped my approach to what research is for. I think a lot of times in academia, we can kind of get stuck in these, you know, this pattern of we we do the research, we write it, we publish it, we do the research, we write it, we publish it, we maybe talk about it somewhere, usually in an academic space, right? And we consider ourselves engaging with the public if we just go tell it to literally anybody that's not an academic, right? Like, I'm going to go give a lecture somewhere that's not academic, and therefore, it is now publicly engaged. But we're continuously challenging them, you know, how can you actually use this? How can you both use it for the audiences you think it should be used for and can help, but also like how can they inform that work? And really trying to think outside the box with that really helped me think, you know, oh, so research can actually do something. It can have an impact. It can be used for things. And it really gave me this desire to use research. I was like, I like doing it, sure, but I really like wish I could do something with it. And I remember, you know, even in the dissertation process, that was that constant question from my committee, just like, so what do you want to do with this? And I was like, I don't even know. And I really think more than anything, though, it wasn't necessarily that product that I yet needed to do things with. I just needed to be thinking in that way. And that's literally most of my job now is what's needed and what can you do with it? How can you use this? I don't do any research right now that doesn't have a purpose, that doesn't have a use and stuff that's going to come out of it that's actually going to impact our program areas. And I found, you know, it really actually renewed my passion for research to be able to do that. You know, I'm sitting there going, I have such a purpose when I'm reading now. I have such a purpose when I'm annotating. And yeah, it really, it inspired me to have those experiences working with the faculty. Given what you've just talked about with you know, thinking about research as applied. I also kind of want to ask you about interdisciplinarity because you've been in women's studies, you know, you've been in American culture studies, you have experience working in and across disciplines, right? And straddling multiple disciplines rather than being sort of firmly in only one kind of method or approach. So I'm especially thinking for like young listeners, right? College students who might be listening to this, you know, what do you think were some of the strengths of that interdisciplinary approach? Maybe also what were challenges to that kind of how you think about disciplines now being on the other side of your academic journey and doing the work that you're doing? Having that experience working within multiple disciplines and across disciplines, I would say it's kind of best summed up by Dr. Rebecca Kinney. I remember taking a course with her. It was to 
we really think through research methods. It was a research methods course. And she had this like monstrous task of trying to get us all to think about literally every research method available to us across all of these disciplines <laughs> and to really think about our research methods for our dissertation. And I remember her biggest point across all of them was what matters most is asking yourself the question, what's going to actually get me the answer to this question, right? What is the best way to get at the answer to this question? And by having experience in all of these different fields and across these fields, you know, and I purposely took different courses in different kinds of research methods so that I felt like I had that toolbox to pull from. And because of that, the first thing I ask myself now on everything is, what's the best way to get the answer to that question? And I have a toolbox to pull from. There's a reason that I'm thinking well, history might get us at a certain type of thing that I'm looking at, right? It's because of my experience with a humanistic research methods course that first introduced me to oral history. And I went, that's something I'll put it on the back burner for later, right? But literally just taking like folklore courses changed my perspective on things and on, you know, why we do things and how we do them and why that matters. And I would say, you know, it's really just getting to see things through multiple lenses and in different ways. And I really think that in a way it can kind of help you understand literally just the concept of intersectionality when different lenses and different ways of seeing the world intersect. What do you see and what do you prioritize in that moment? And that's one of the reasons, you know, I really wanted to go into the interdisciplinary field. I wanted all those tools. I wanted all those perspectives. And I had been looking for so long through a very specific perspective. And I wanted the guidance on how to see things in new ways. And that's what being in an inter interdisciplinary program at the college level means, is you get that guidance on how to do it instead of having to figure that out for yourself. And some people are really amazing at doing that just naturally, right? Seeing things from all these different angles and perspectives. And I've always tried to, but having that guidance was really helpful, <laughs> you know, because you just get examples at the very least through your coursework. What advice would you give to someone who is interested in a career in nonprofit work or community engagement work? What would you advise them as they're, you know, finishing up maybe an undergrad degree or a graduate degree? What are some things they could do to be thinking about taking what they've learned and putting it in a more applied direction? Find other people who are interested in that kind of work, whether it's the subject matter, find your passion, find your area. When I first saw that Power Switch Action is working toward a multiracial feminist democracy, I knew that's the mission I wanted to get on board with. And especially when you're doing nonprofit work, an alignment with the mission and the vision is incredibly important. More than anything, that's probably what they're looking for is do you align with our mission and vision? Do you get it? And so, you know, find out what your passions are, the things you really care about in the world that you want to see change and you want to contribute to. And then guide your skill development around that, right? Try and apply it toward that. So, you know, I'm really interested in identity and our personal narratives and how they shape that and how they allow us to negotiate it. And so, you know, I shaped my research around narrative and identity. But I also wanted the skills that I thought might go with that. So I learned like digital humanities work and I learned how to do social media and communications because if you're going to share a personal narrative, you got to have some communication skills, right? So that's really whatever it is you're interested in doing. Think about that. Think about the skills you would need to really pursue that passion. And it might be a lot and you might not even be sure exactly what all those are. And that's totally cool. One of the priorities I had throughout grad school was pick up as many skills as you can, just in case, because you never know. And really more than anything, I would say, you know, find that passion, identify as many skills as you think might have to do with it, and then try and harness your educational journey toward that, whether it's picking up assistantships, internships, something that you actually get credit for, especially if you don't have extra capacity. That's one thing that, you know, I really want to consider is a lot of people who want to do this kind of work are the kind of people who come from communities that need this work, right? I come from a low income community. I come from a working class background. It matters to me to help families like mine have more say in their lives and not be so overexploited. So because of that, I really wanted to work in this, but 
there were some barriers and you know there were barriers to my education there was you know it took me longer to get through undergrad than I probably should have because of having to work full time and so really that's my you know especially if if you're like me and you're a person who doesn't always have that capacity to do extra on top just find ways to finagle what you already have available to you your workspaces your educational spaces and really do find other people that are interested in that because chances are they've already developed some skills or some knowledge bases you haven't and you can work together and that collaborative aspect of education is something you don't get everywhere but it's really valuable in nonprofit spaces to be able to take one program and another program and work together toward common goals or one organization and another organization and build a coalition that's really powerful so you know work on those collaborative skills anything you'd like to share with listeners about ways to get involved with the work that power switch action is doing or information about you know kind of finding local organizations that might align with their values yeah so first off obviously follow us on social media power switch action that's what we are across all of our <laughs> platforms. We amplify a lot of the work of our affiliates so you can kind of see what's going on in your area. We have 21 grassroots organizations across the country, so one of them might be in your hometown. Feel free to look them up and see if there's anything you can get on board with. In general, I would say look to your local news sources, and that sounds funny, but it, local news often covers the kinds of things that you would want to get involved with, right? Whether it's a tenants union that has formed and is now pushing back against a corporate landlord and a recent news story just covered that and you're like what where did this tenant union come from who's organizing that it turns out it's a grassroots organization right that you can help almost every one of them is looking for volunteers looking for capacity and more importantly looking to develop you as a leader so if you you know if you're remotely interested just show up send emails sign up for newsletters, see what happens, you know, and at the very least, you know, follow in social media and amplify that work, right? Share it. Let people know what's going on. Let people know that there's hope and people are actually doing things. Anything else you'd like to say before we close? Any advice or last thoughts? One thing that was told to me in my PhD program that has proven super true is that road is going to be winding. In this economy, in this field, like in any, nobody is certain right now. And so there is no way to find a certain path, right? You're not, you're not going to find a specific one. It's always going to take detours you didn't expect. And that's okay. Embrace that because it is the detours that get you where you want to go. If I had gotten an academic job right out of the gate, I would not get to work with Power Switch Action right now. And I really enjoy it. And I really believe in the work we're doing. And I, you know, I'm breaking into a space that isn't usually super open to humanities PhDs. And so, you know, embrace the windingness and just keep focused on your priorities and your passions. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. It was great to talk with you. You can learn more about Power Switch Action by visiting their website at powerswitchaction.org or following them on social media. If you're interested in fellowship programs at ACLS, visit acls.org. Listeners can keep up with ICS happenings by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSBGSU and on our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. For more information or to propose a guest for a future episode, visit us at bgsu.edu forward slash BG Ideas. Sound engineering for this episode was provided by Brendan Akatura and Marco Mendoza. Research was provided by Joe Elias.